Hello and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Bryant and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during this question and answer session to provide a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. Our next webinar is on August 5th. It's Raising Family Historians, How to Capture the Hearts of Future Genealogists with Brianne Ballard. And that'll be at the same time, Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. For today's webinar, we'll be holding a live question and answer session with Catherine Grant. And if Catherine is ready, then we'll turn the time over to her to answer questions from the audience. Great. Brian, thank you so much. And everybody, I am so excited about this, this webinar today. This is actually one of my favorite things because I always learn so much, and I hope that it will be a great experience for you too, that you'll be able to learn a lot of cool things. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, and you should be seeing the presentation, but I'm also going to bring up the chat so that I can have that off to the side. And I, so to start out, I just kind of wanted to, to say how we want to work this question and answer session today. So the types of questions that we're looking to answer are questions about familysearch.org or general questions about family history. The thing that we're not looking for, unfortunately, because it would be kind of cool if we could do this, but at least for this webinar today, we're not looking for questions about specific research. So in other words, a question such as, how do I do a merge, is the kind of question that we would like to answer, whereas the question, a question like, I'm trying to find James Brown, my fifth great-grandfather who was adopted as a child, something that would take a lot of research and that would probably be um, applicable only to one person. Those are not the kind of questions that we want to answer today. So in asking your questions, try to make them applicable to people, to everybody uh, who would be attending the webinar. And that way we'll have a great experience for everybody. So we did have some people send questions in ahead of time. And so we'll be addressing those. And I think I've got about six of them. But as you come up with questions, or if you have some on your mind, please feel free to put them in the chat. And then we'll address the chat questions after we go through the questions that were submitted ahead of time. So Terrell asks, I know of two ways to attach a residence to a person and family tree. One is you can do it manually in the other information section, and the other is that you can do it while you're attaching a source. And just to show you, just in case, sometimes if we hear words, it doesn't necessarily compute to where is that in family tree. So let's just switch over really quick. And the place where you can add a residence if you want to is here on the other information or in the other information section. So I've gone to Mary Ethel Dolman's uh, page in Family Search in Family Tree. And if I wanted to add a residence manually, I could come down here, say add information, and then I look for residence. And then I'd have to, of course, know the information and I would fill it out, click save. And that would be, that's how you can add it manually. And then also when you're adding a source, you can, um, and this doesn't really show it, but you, you know, when you're attaching a source, if the record has a residence, you have the option to add that as you're attaching the source. And so Terrell's question was, is there any other way? Unfortunately, I'm not aware of another way. I only know of those two ways. If anybody does know of an, another way, please put it in the chat because I'd love to learn. Okay, on to the next question. When doing genealogy, where do you put your birth parents on the chart and their descendants before or after your adoptive family and their descendants? Do you make two separate family trees and line them up or is there another solution? Now, I'm guessing that the person who asked this question 
is on the webinar today. So if you, if I'm not understanding your question, please post a clarification in the chat. But what I understand is that you're probably referring to family search and you're wondering, let's just say that Mary Ethel Dolman had an adoptive set of parents and a birth set of parents. So you could add right here, we've got her birth parents, but if there were adopted parents, we could click add parents and add them. Does it matter which order they show in? I think it's probably personal preference, to be honest with you. I know some people um, have very friendly, like my, my niece actually has a good relationship with her birth mother and with her, my sister, her adoptive mother. And so for her, that might not even be an issue who you show first. For other people, I can imagine it could be an issue and you definitely want one person at the top. Once you add a, a separate set of parents, there will be an option to set, quote, the preferred parent. It's just a little checkbox. And so whoever you wanted to show first, you would set them as the preferred parent, and then the other parent would show beneath. So I hope that answers the question. But again, if it doesn't answer the question, please let me know and we'll, we'll do a follow-up on that. Okay, somebody else asked, why can't I get family search and ancestry to link? It would save me so much time. I am guessing you've already tried this, but for the interest of everybody else, I thought I'd mention it. If you click the help icon on pretty much any family search page, then choose help center and then type in ancestry as your search term, you're going to get a bunch of articles about um, how you can link family search and ancestry that's supposed to work <laughs> but it doesn't always and so I'm gonna actually pop out of presenter mode and just grab this URL and throw it in the chat so just in case somebody wants to see that um, help center article that explains how to link an, a family search with an ancestry account or with actually with an ancestry tree go to that article and hopefully if you answer those questions or excuse me if you follow I'm trying to multitask and it's not working so hopefully if you follow the instructions in that help article it will work but if it doesn't honestly I would contact ancestry help rather than family search help not because family search or family search support not because family search support isn't good, but because I suspect that the issue probably has to do with ancestry. So I'd check, I'd call them first, ask for their help resolving it. If they aren't able to help, maybe call family search. Um, and otherwise, I'd just escalate it. If you don't get satisfaction the first time by talking to a help support representative, ask them to uh, escalate it up the chain to somebody uh, who has probably more resources, maybe more background and knowledge and so forth. Okay, so let me get back now to the question where we were. Okay, another person said, a photo has been uploaded to family search. The person, person submitting the photo, photo put the frame around the entire photo and then just labeled it as one name. So they tagged it to one person, but there's four siblings in the photo. Because that frame is taking up the whole photo, this user said, now I can't add the other people. So how can I add these people? I did not know the answer to that question. So I contacted Beth Ann Wiseman, who is a Family Search Memories QA engineer, and this is what she said. It's a bug, and you would want to open a support case, or you could attend a Facebook Live event with Ron Tanner and report the issue there. Another thing you could possibly do is contact the person who created the tag and the frame that goes with it and ask them if they could resize it. But you should be able to add frames and tags even if somebody added one that takes up the whole screen. So that's definitely a bug and you'd want to report that. Okay, what is the proper procedure if you feel that something worthwhile should be added to a person's memories if the person is read only and nothing has been added? And you might have come across this, for instance, um, famous uh, figures in political history, in early history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, famous monarchs and so forth. A lot of those records have been locked 
or made read only just because when they had them, they actually used to not have them locked. And so many people would come and add things and do incorrect merges and join people to incorrect parents and et cetera, et cetera. So for these quote famous records that seem to attract a lot of attention, family search has made those records read only so that only, um, really employees can make changes to those records. So what Beth Ann said, if you, I, I went to her again, because again, I didn't know the answer to this question. She said, if you have something that is of interest to that person, and you really would like to have it added, then upload the memories to family search. So they would be in your gallery and go ahead and add the title, the description, the dates, etc. cetera, uh, tag it, but don't attach it to anybody in the tree. And also if you have more than one memory that you want to add, you could put them all in one album, then contact support, Give them the URL to your memory or to your album of memories and also the PID of the person where you want those memories attached and then ask them to attach the memories. So that's how you can handle memories on a read-only person. Okay, this is a really good question. When you have a whole list of duplicates, so for instance, you've gone to Family Tree and you have, you know, let's say five duplicates showing up for this person. Is there an easier way to deal with them besides checking each one individually? And the, the short answer to that is no. And actually, the long answer is no, too. But for to add a little more explanation on that, the reason that I think it's very wise that Family Search doesn't allow that is that so many apparent duplicates are not really duplicates. Some look like duplicates as a result of bad merges. Others just look like duplicates because they're part of the same family, but maybe they're a cousin or something. They've got the same name, but again, they're not really a duplicate. So I think it's a really good thing to just compare your original record and one proposed duplicate as a at a time. And we actually have some webinars on that, on uh, merging duplicates. And also one is called, oh dear, what was it called? Uh, something like fixing sticky, tricky problems in family tree. And that goes into how you can analyze whether a proposed duplicate really is a duplicate. Because one of the biggest problems that I've seen in family search and family tree these days is bad merges. So people are just merging a whole bunch of people and families that aren't really the same person. And it just results in a whole bunch of problems, confusion, lost temple work, and other things like that. So it, sure, it would be so nice if there was a faster way to do it. But I think the risk of bad merges is so high that it's better to just do it the slow way. Sorry. Okay, other questions. We're going to go over to the chat here and just start at the top and go through the questions. So Teresa says, where can I find Canadian divorce records? Teresa, I actually do not know the answer to that question. What I would suggest doing, I know that Ancestry.com has a lot of Canadian records, although I don't know if they include Canadian divorce records. And what I would also do if you, for instance, check Ancestry and you can't find what you're looking for. The wiki, the Family Search wiki, is a wonderful resource of the types of records that you can check for a given research question. So what you do is click on search and then click on research wiki. And it says waiting for family search. And then you've got the search box and I would search by location. So I would just um, search by Canada, and then you get, that's the nice thing is if you search for a, a large locality, you get taken straight to that page for that locality. And then you've got all these links that will help you find the information that you're looking for. So that's, if anybody, again, in the chat knows the answer, if you could post that in the chat, that would be awesome. But otherwise, Teresa, this is what I would suggest is um, checking Ancestry.com and also coming to the wiki. 
So I'll go back to family tree. Jeanette says, I have added sources and get the message unfinished attachments. What do I do? That is a great question because I see that all the time too. Let me see if I can find one here. Yeah, on Mary Ethel Thomas, we've got unfinished attachments. So an unfinished attachment many times will be another family member. In fact, you know, we could just look at this right now and see what comes up. So any attached people are going to be, they're going to have a green bar, but anyone who's not attached, okay, here we've got Frank Thomas, a son. Not only is he not attached, well, actually, I'm assuming he's a son. Uh, well, it says he's a son, so I think that's a safe assumption. I'm assuming that family tree would not have displayed these relationships unless they came from the record. So what we're seeing here is that this record has not been attached because Frank is not in family tree. So I, I'll be honest with you, you guys, I am really hesitant to use the add button here because it, the duplicate search in my experience has not been very thorough. So, so let me show you, if I click add, then family search is going to try and do a duplicate search and see if this person already exists. I have had it say the person was that a duplicate wasn't in family tree when it really was. So what I would actually do is probably go back and do a little bit of research and try and see if I could locate this guy already in family tree. And then if I could, I would just attach the source. But if I couldn't, then I would attach the person. And once you've done your due diligence and you know there's not a duplicate, yeah, I could. I would go ahead and add this. But I definitely wouldn't use this add feature unless I'd done a little bit of sanity checking myself. And that's just me. That's not a family search policy. Another option certainly is that you could add this person and do a duplicate search after and you know just to make sure that there wasn't one that family search missed but I don't know I think I prefer to just do the research first do the little sanity checking and then uh, add the person if necessary and attach the source so I'm going to cancel out of this because, to go by what I just said, I don't actually know with the, whether this Frank Thomas is already in the tree. Oh, and another thing I should mention about that, Jeanette and everybody, is that sometimes you will get you know, when you go in there to unfinished attachments, you'll see somebody like a border or something. Should you attach the source then? Yeah, that's probably an okay thing to do. But on the other hand, I don't think you should feel bad if you don't attach the source because you're not confident that it should be, you know, maybe you'd, you'd want to do more research, but it's not your family member or whatever. I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't think it's a bad thing if you don't feel comfortable attaching the source. So if you do want to do the unfinished attachments and you're confident that they're all correct, yeah, go ahead and attach them. But don't feel bad if you would like to do a little more research or if you just want to focus on other things. Because this is a collaborative tree, <clears throat> excuse me, and other people are going to come along and they they're somebody else may attach the source to so i hope that helps and that i again that is just my opinion and my way of working as i just offer that for what it's worth and you may feel better about a different approach Okay, let's go to Catherine's question. She says, I know that for places of burials, actually, actual cemetery names are not accepted as standard. What is the best place to add this information? Actually, Catherine, I have seen cemeteries as part of standards. And so I am trying to remember what I've been told about that. One approach that you can do, let's get back to a place over here, and again, we'll just experiment where I'm not going to save this information, but let's just say that it was the Oak Hills Cemetery. Oh, that's the date. Whoops. Okay. Uh, actually, I wanted San Jose, California, but you notice one came up in Minnesota. Let's see if San Jose comes up. No.
nope, it doesn't come up. So I would say, first of all, see if it does come up. This is actually where my brother is buried. So that's why I knew the cemetery. If it doesn't come up, what I've been doing is just putting San Jose, um, California, uh, and just putting the city place name. And then I might put the uh, the cemetery in the reason statement. I understand that you can submit a request to Family Search to have a standard added. And I believe, okay, somebody correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe that the way to submit that feedback is to scroll to the bottom of the page, click feedback, then do uh I okay, this I do not remember. One takes you out to get satisfaction and one lets you submit to Family Tree. Okay, it's the problem. So what you would do to uh, suggest a, an addition to standards is click feedback, click problem, and then fill out this form and submit it to Family Search. I wouldn't probably recommend going to get satisfaction to do that because it, people from family search do monitor get satisfaction and just in case that's not clear if i were to click suggestion or compliment it's going to take me over to oh you know what i wonder if it does yeah it looks like it's going to take me over to the community yeah to get satisfaction so I would not make a suggestion for an addition to standards here because there's not a guarantee that the right person will see it. People from Family Search do monitor these forums, but again, out of all the thousands and thousands of posts that are made, it's possible that your suggestion for a, a new standard might be overlooked. So I would definitely use the other one that goes directly, use problem that goes directly to Family Search. Okay, let's go to the next question. Corrine says, I have photos of relatives on my photo folder in my computer. Trying to scroll here. In Family Search, where do I where do I put in the in Family Search, where do I put in the photo and the same in Ancestry? I tried once and it came in a quarter the wrong way. Corrine, I'm afraid I'm not understanding that question very well. I apologize. Uh, maybe you could add some extra detail to that. It, it sounds to me like you're asking how to get photos into Family Tree. If that's what you're asking, but I fear that I may be wrong about that, you would go to Memories and then go to your gallery. And then there's an Add button, and you can add photos that way. So as we scroll through this, we'll see if we get more clarification on that. Okay, Ginny says, I have a birth set of parents and then an adopted set also. You said to set the preferred parent. How do you do that? I don't have a record up with two sets of parents do you know what? For that, I think I'm just going to go over to beta because there we can play. And if you're wondering what beta is, it's a sandbox. It's a place where you can just experiment. So I didn't want to mess with the data there and add fake parents, but in beta, we can do that. So I'm going to sign in. And let's go to back to, oh, we have different people here. Let's go to Samuel's page. Uh, oh, he doesn't have any parents. So let's just add some parents. We'll say Samuel Hibbert. Let's say he's the same as his son. And we'll say he's male. He's deceased. Next. And we're just going to create him. And then let's say he's got, a. Uh, this is his birth father, and now we're going to say he's got an adoptive father. So let's call him Fred Jones. And he's male, he's deceased. We're going to add him. And when you have two sets of 
anybody, like two sets of parents or two spouses, you can set one as preferred. So the system automatically set the most recent one as preferred, but what if I didn't want him to be preferred? What if I wanted the other? I just click preferred. Oh, now that's interesting, you guys. It looks like I misspoke. I thought I remembered that it would reorder the, the people to put the preferred one on top, but it's not. Let me just refresh and see if it does. But if it doesn't, then I apologize. I gave the wrong. Oh, no. When I refreshed, it did put the, the person on top. So apparently, if you change the preferred person, it won't immediately reorder that person, but once you refresh, it will put your preferred person on the top. Wait a second. Did we? Okay, I'm getting mixed up. We I, now. I did. I did Fred last time, right? Okay, let's try it again with Samuel, just to be sure. So now Samuel's preferred. He's at the bottom. Let's refresh and see if Samuel goes to the top. Yep, it does. Okay, I hope that helps answer that question, Ginny. Peter says, while family tree information is saved for everyone, most of us save information in other places, such as my heritage or ancestry, right? Is there any way to create some sort of electric will that will save the information for future generations? To my knowledge, Family Search has been talking about um, doing some kind of a legacy, yeah, some kind of a, a, a statement where you can designate who will get your assets, like your photos and so forth in Family Tree after you die. But to my knowledge, that has not been implemented. And do you know, honestly, who I would ask about that is James Tanner. So if you Google um, genealogy star or probably James Tanner, he is a former attorney and an extremely knowledgeable family historian. And I'll bet you he could give you really good advice. On the off chance, James, if you're on this call, please chime in. But I kind of wouldn't expect him to be on this call today. So I hope that helps. And I'd like to know the answer to that question too. Oh, and thank you for people answering, adding to the answers of the questions. Let's see, Ginny, looks like you were answering. Look at the record and image. Okay, Kristen asks, how do you fix the attachments when the children or siblings are in the other from family tree? I'm not sure what that means. Kristen, maybe if you have a PID where that's showing up, could you maybe put that in the chat so we can take a look at it? Yeah, I apologize. I'm actually not sure what that's referring to. But in the meantime, let's go on to Wanda's question then. Is there a plan to let us be able to rearrange photos and documents in a person's Family Search Memories page? I'd like to put them in chronological order. My understanding is that that is coming. I, uh, Beth Ann Wiseman mentioned that at a different webinar that I gave. I'm not sure when it's coming, but I would keep watching the gallery for the ability to do that. And then also, Wanda says, if I have photos in albums, do those albums disappear after I die and my family search account is deactivated? I do not know the answer to that question. Do you know what? At the end, I'll tell you what, I'll save this chat and any questions that we couldn't answer, I'll find answers to those. And then I believe, Bryant, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that we could post these in the YouTube comments for people. So I would say if we don't answer, we're not able to answer your question in today's webinar, check the webinar recording after we post it and we'll do our best to post answers to those questions. Okay, Mardi says you can put the cemetery. Yeah. So, uh, oh, that's a good point, Mardi. Yeah, you can actually type. Let's let's show what Mardi is talking about. If you come to, let's do a christening right here. Um, well, actually, no. Let's do a burial because I want to use the Oak Hill Cemetery thing as an example. So we go to a burial, and I say Oak. Hills Cemetery, San Jose, California, United States. 
Oh, I did it again. I stuck it in the date. Okay, let's see. Um, let's say 2002, just for grins. And we'll say the place of burial. Oh, that's why it didn't come up before, you guys. Now, this is a good lesson, actually. I typed in Oak Hills Cemetery, and I said, oh, I looked down there, and it didn't come up, but it was because I didn't have the exact correct name. So make sure you got the correct name at first, but let's just say that um, that, that I didn't think that was right, so I, I'm going to say it's like Oak Cemetery or something. Then you get the option to just choose the city, but when you do, oh, it didn't work. So Mardi, I, I've had it done in the past where I could type like Oak Cemetery, helps if I spell it right, and it would let me retain that cemetery name. Okay, that's what you've got to do. So I don't know if you noticed how I was able to do that. First of all, I had to standardize it to San Jose, Santa Clara, California. Then I had to go back and edit. And if I could just, I, I typed Oak Cemetery in front, then I had to click outside, like not click on the standard, um, because that would have made this turn into San Jose. So I just typed the cemetery name in, clicked outside, and it saved that cemetery name in here. But the standard is still a standard recognized by Family Search. So Mardi, thank you very much for bringing that up and for helping us figure out how to do that. OK, let's see. Next question. Corrine, you said, I don't know how to get it into Family Tree. So I hope that helped then, Corrine, that you can go to Memories and you can go to Gallery and then you can click the plus button here and add your memory that way. Another way to do it is to go to the person. See if we go back to Samuel and then click Memories. And you can also upload photos or other types of memories here. So I hope that helps. Terrell says, if the picture's on its side, can it be rotated a quarter? And yes, it can. Actually, I wonder. Oh, yeah, I'm in beta, so it's not going to let me see my memories. Let's go back to the live system. So I'm going to log out of beta. And we'll log into the real system, which instead of beta is www. OK, so when you have a memory that you want to rotate, you just bring up, and I don't need to rotate but this, but I'll just bring it up for illustrations actions. Uh, if you click actions, then you've got your options to rotate left or rotate right. So hope that helps, Terrell. And I believe that it, that actually the default is a quarter rotation. So if you actually wanted it flipped upside down, like you'd have to do rotate left twice. Okay. Let's go to the next question. These are such good questions, you guys. Thank you so much. Oh, Catherine made a good comment. Most of the cemeteries I deal with are family cemeteries, and Family Search probably wouldn't want them or wouldn't, you know, add them as a standardized place. Very good point. Okay, Mardi, you said put the relationship as biological on the biological and adopted on the adopted. That's a very good point. Let's go back over and see how to do that. So on this, on any, on a, um, on any parent relationship, if you click the edit button here next to the parents, you can actually choose the type of relationship. Nope, you know what? I'm wrong. It has to be on the kid. So we'll go to Mary and click the pencil next to Mary. 
and that lets you choose the type of relationship. So let's suppose that they were, these were adoptive parents, then I would click edit and I would choose adoptive, but I'm gonna cancel this. Okay, so B4 asks James Tanner. James is, uh, you know what, I, we could just Google for him. He is amazing. He is one of the most brilliant genealogists and just an all around great guy, Very, so knowledgeable. So if we search for James Tanner, um, I think his blog, well, let's just try James Tanner genealogy. Yeah, there's a genealogy star. That's what I was looking for. This is one of his blogs. So genealogystar.blogspot.com and you could contact him through his blog. Oh, Beth Ann, you are on the call. Very cool. So Beth Ann is the most amazing guru of memories. She can answer any question about memories or she can find the answer. So Thank you. And she says there was another question she was going to answer, but I forgot the question already. So please, whoever had that question, if you could repost your question that didn't get answered, that would be awesome. So Randy says click the gray area to standardize it. I'm referring to standardized places, I'm, I'm guessing. Jeanette says when I obtain certificates from the GRO in England, is it okay to post them in memories in Family Search Family Tree? Jeanette, my understanding, I actually, I'm so glad you asked this. I looked it up on the GRO site and they do not consider this a, a, a copyright violation. Now, if you were to sell them or you were to charge people for looking at them, I believe that would comprise a copyright violation, but according to the GRO site, it is not a violation for you to post a personal copy on a, a family tree or some kind of genealogy resource, a free genealogy resource. So Jeanette, second question, what about certificates from some of the counties and states in the US? Does the government own copyright to the certificates? That is a really good question. I will, I do not absolutely know the answer. That might be another question for James or actually for the gal called the legal genealogist. She may have already published on this. And um, let's see, her name's Judy, I believe. So go to www.legalgenealogist.com and you could either probably find the answer to that question or send her a message and get an answer. But that's such a common question that I would imagine she's addressed it. My understanding is, again, this falls under fair use for the U.S. Now, if you were to, like, get all the birth certificates from a certain county and upload them all, you know, thousands and thousands to a site and charge people to view them, I believe that would not be fair use. That, that would be considered a copyright violation. But if you're just uploading a single certificate here and there that you obtained from a county courthouse or whatever, my understanding is that that's acceptable under fair use. Somebody please correct me if I'm wrong on that. And you may want to check with um, Judy, the legal genealogist. Okay, let's go. Mardi made more comments about the standardization. Thank you, Mardi. Great, Corrine. Glad that helped. Oh, and Beth Ann. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and read this answer. I realize that everybody on the call today can see the chat, but people attend or people watching the recording of this webinar will not be able to see the chat for whatever reason. Zoom doesn't record it. So Beth Ann says the other question about memories ordering on the person page. Be sure to add dates to your memories before you attach them to the person. The chronological order will come from the dates on your memories. I don't know when this feature will come out. It may be a while, but yes, Family Search would love to support chronological order for your memories. Just add dates to your memories now and be patient. Great advice. Mardi says the same child can be on both relationships under adopted and biological. Yes, that, thank you for pointing that out, Mardi. So if Mary Ethel had two sets of parents over here, then she can show as a child both of her adoptive parents and of her biological parents. 
So thank you for pointing that out. Kathy says, no, do I click on the match of her grandmother? So Kathy, let me make sure I understand. What I believe you're saying is that there is a source for one person, but a match is coming up for the grandmother as if she was that person. If that's the case, then no, you don't want to attach the, the in other words, you don't want to attach the granddaughter's record to the grandmother's page. The reason I'm hesitating when I say that is, let's see if we can um, take, find something here that would illustrate what I'm thinking about. Okay, this is a good example. On English christening records, there are going to normally be three people listed. There's going to be the child who got christened, there's going to be the dad, and there's going to be the mom. Family Search considers, even though this is one record, Family Search will create a separate source for each person. So there is a source for Mary Ethel as the gal being christened. There is a separate source for Robert as the father of the gal being christened. And there's yet another source for Susanna as the mother of the, the girl being christened. So you want to attach the source for each person to them. So you might see Robert's source and say, oh, I should just attach that to Mary. But no, you want to attach Mary's source to Mary and Robert's source to Robert, even though they all came from the same christening record. That is one of the most difficult concepts, I think, to understand. And so if that doesn't seem clear, please post another question in the chat. And I've actually got a little graphic that I could send to you or post on the YouTube page. And I think it explains it maybe more easily than words or than just looking at this source. Okay, Wanda says, if the albums don't go away, how do people access the albums? Is the album attached to everyone's memories page who is tagged in the photos? Beth Ann, would you like to answer that? And then Kathy says, what is the source of yearbook photos? My sister's likeness is attributed to several women. On the yearbook photos, I believe that if you click on the photo, it should give you the source to that. And Beth Ann, please correct me if I'm wrong, if you're still on the chat or on the, the webinar. And you know what, everybody, that is all the questions that have been submitted. And so if we, I'll, I'll give it just a few more minutes in case we have more questions, but otherwise, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up if we don't. Okay, Beth Ann just answered, and so I'll read that for those of you who are watching this webinar recording. She said, albums do not go away. When you view a memory, there is a list of albums. So if a memory is part of an album, you can navigate to the album from the memory. That's good to know. You can share your album and people can mark them as a favorite and save it in their gallery. And Beth Ann comments also, you can also find albums in the find feature of memories. And where that is, is if you go over to the gallery, that she's talking about this find function right here, not the find function when you're in family tree. So they're actually two separate find functions. So for memories, you go to gallery and you choose find. Thank you for the kind comments. Let's see, and Beth Ann comments, you can also find albums in the find feature of memories. This find is somewhat limited now, but will be expanded in the future. So we'll just give it another minute or two. Kristen says she'd like more Q&As in the future. I think we will because Kristen, interestingly enough, we did one of these, I don't know, Bryant, what has it been, three or four months ago? And there was such a good response and people said, yes, please do this again. So that's actually why we did today's. And we will go ahead and do those as often in the future as they seem to be helpful. 
One thing I did want to comment on, it was incredibly helpful, those of you who submitted questions ahead of time too. I loved getting the questions during the webinar, but it was also helpful to get them ahead of time because then I could do a little digging and kind of get the answers ready. So if you would like to attend a webinar like this in the future, just keep your eyes open for it. And then when you see one announced, if you have questions, do feel free to submit them ahead of time and, and we'll be sure to address them. Okay, I think we're ready to wrap up then. Bryant, I'll go ahead and turn the time back over to you. Great, thanks so much for all the great answers, Catherine. You bet. And let me just share the screen once again. And thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it and all your questions and we hope they were answered. And if you have more questions, feel free to email Catherine um, or us at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. And also please join us for our webinar next week on August 5th, Raising Family Historians, How to Capture the Hearts of Future Genealogists. That'll be with Brianne Ballard at, on Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Oh, do you know what, Bryant? I see Kathy says, I believe, we, I see one more question, if I could answer that quickly. Kathy says, course, I believe, it, thank you. She says, I believe it was a mistake. Who do I contact to correct the information? Kathy, if the source was just attached to the wrong person, you can just go into the source and click detach and that will just remove it from that person. If you're not able to do it, then I would contact support. So thank you for that question. And I think that's it. Awesome. Uh, we'll upload this webinar by Saturday. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody.